the, uh, thank you, Pearson, and do I have to pay for my lunch now? Yes. <laughs> Double. The, uh, I want to thank you guys for being here, and I want to thank the other members of society. I think uh, uh, Pearson might have introduced everybody that, that was here. Uh, I was kind of surprised that when I got to be a member of the Society of Entrepreneurs, and I got to tell you, I really didn't even know about it. And uh, one of my partners uh, contacts some people, Craig Weiss, who uh, you guys work with at Paragon, and uh, nominated me. And so I don't think anybody, uh, uh, Dick, Scott, Denise, any of us were seeking, or it wasn't like we were trying to get a fraternity or sorority. And, uh, but it's a nice recognition of, of hard work and taking risk uh, over the years. I also figured out something a few weeks ago. We, we, we've got four new members, plus Scott uh, Morris is, uh, is going to be uh, receiving his special award. And uh, Denise, who got, was inducted last year with me, said, uh, oh, I hear you're speaking. And, and that prompted a call to Pierce. I said, I thought it was an informal lunch. I was going to be sitting at a table with five or six people. We were going to sit here and talk. And, uh, and so Denise said, oh, no, uh, that's, you've got to get up and talk and speak, give a presentation. So I think what it is, it's like my initiation. I didn't know about it. And so I get chosen. Pearson asked me, and I figure that everybody's doing it. And so I've got to get up here and, uh, and give a little talk. The, uh, it, it's nice that I'm sitting here uh, talking to people and, and learning about passion because I think uh, uh, on anything that any of us do, and I know a lot of people in the room, you've got to have passion uh, about what you do. You've got to like getting up every morning, going to work, and, uh, and, and doing um, what you're, what you're going to be doing. And uh, I, uh, I had a good family foundation of wanting to uh, succeed and, and do well. Uh, my parents worked together and they had a uh, business and my dad was kind of an engineer. My mother uh, was from an immigrant family that came from uh, Poland or Russia, I think, back when they were in Poland and Russia. Sometimes it was Poland, sometimes it was Russia. But it, it kept switching back and forth. But I think at the time when they left it was Poland. And uh, my mother uh, would sit around the dinner table. That's what we would talk about as a business. And uh, I've kind of carried that over with my kids. They're more interested in that uh, library or whatever. But uh, they're, I, I, I think I'm the only iPhone, non-iPhone user in my family. But the, we would sit around and talk about business. And my, my parents worked together. God love them because they went to work in the morning together. They took separate cars, came home in separate cars, but shared the same bedroom, which was great. And, and uh, had a beautiful marriage, and they, and they worked together doing it. So I, I worked in a family business, which my dad, uh, back in the earlier days, was caught on to the CB radios. And uh, so I like all the Convoy movies, all that stuff. Uh, I was actually a neighbor of Dick Gnomsky, and I remember our swimming pool that we got, I mean, I wanted my, my mom wanted a swimming pool, and my dad had a good year in the CB business, so he went and bought a swimming pool. And, uh, so it, it was indoctrinated. In fact, my parents, and, and this is important with my kids, and I didn't do it with my kids as much as I should have, but I used to work on my dad's assembly line. And uh, it, was, it was me and 100 people that would sit there, and I was 12 years old. It wasn't child labor. Nobody said it because I, I wanted to do it, and I was getting paid. And it was when I wasn't in school. I went to school and I graduated. But uh, I would sit on the assembly line, and I would stack transformers which uh, I guess anybody seen a transport that big and I was just one of the people and I always remember and 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 I've, I've kept this lesson is that they would uh, they would say hey junior whatever they call me they, they knew my name but slow down and uh, cause <laughs> they, they were getting paid by the hour they figured I was getting paid some other way and they were stacking up and uh, so they would uh, ask me not to work quite as hard and I, I, I took a lesson, my mother told me this too, and you, you start thinking this stuff kind of hits back with you, good foundations. My mother, my mother's father uh, didn't speak very good English. And uh, he came to the United States, moved to Patterson, New Jersey, I think, and uh, operated a, a loom, and, uh, which I don't think uh, that kind of stuff, but he had big hands, I mean, probably twice the size of mine. And my mother told me, he used to operate two looms because he could make more money. Somehow he could grab on or he figured it out. And so he moves to Morristown, Tennessee. I'm not a Tennessee fan, but he was right <laughs> near there. And he had, a, he had a silk mill, never drove a car. And we used to go visit him. And he, I'd go down in his basement 
and uh, and he had piles of stuff everywhere and uh, he kind of retired and I'm like what do you do and he didn't speak very good English I didn't have a lot of conversation with him but basically we did he carried a magnet which was one of his few possessions which I still have and he would walk around Morristown Tennessee and he would take his magnet and he'd touch it on stuff and he'd pick it up and he'd carry it home and he'd collect it and he'd sell it and uh, he eventually moved to Memphis worked for my dad did the same thing the same transfer when I was building when we messed up he would take them apart and he'd scrap them. So he always thinking, I mean, he was a simple guy. When he passed away, he had a suitcase, and there was not much in it, and he'd saved a lot of money over the years because he, he had worked hard. So I was kind of instilled with that uh, in my family. I want to say one thing, and Pearson uh, said about two, two things just about Memphis, and I've chosen to, and I don't know how many people in the room grew up here, but I've chosen to put my roots down here, and my family's here, my wife's family's here, my kids are fourth generation. And I'm O-R-G-E-L, not O-R-G-I-L-L. -L. So I got left out of that money train. And uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I went to MUS and I always used to get special favors because they couldn't spell my name. And I would stay out of trouble sometimes because they thought I was related. They'd say, oh yeah, well I know your, your dad or your uncle. And I'd be, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, and I, and I kind of stayed out of trouble doing that, but um, the, uh, this is a great city, and I know we've, we've got a lot of problems, but two things, observation, I meant to say at the beginning, and you brought it up here when we were talking about the Tigers, but I, uh, I, I think one of the greatest things that brings us all together, and I noticed that the Grizzlies are great, and I love the Grizzlies, and that's, that's a big plus business-wise even in our community, but having the Tigers here, and the fact, and, and I was at a meeting the other day, and we were deciding on our next meeting, and it actually is going to be this February 22nd, and I think that's a Tigers game. And so 20 people in the room, if someone says, someone check the calendar, see if it's a Tigers game. Because I can tell you, 10 people wouldn't be in there. But it's one thing that unites the city. It's wonderful. I know they won last night. And, uh, and, and Tennessee's probably all right, but I just think that's one thing that brings everybody in. And it's, I think it's unique to Memphis because I don't think you could go to any community. You could go to Chicago, Los Angeles. You know, that some people might like Illinois. Some people might like DePaul. Didn't your child go to DePaul? And, uh, but not everybody says, oh, they have a team that they all identify with, and most people here do identify with. And the other thing, and I want everybody to look around the room real quick, just kind of look at everybody's face. We live in a city that is uh, predominantly minority. And, and this is a room full of mostly white people. And that, as far as an entrepreneur goes, and I know the society does a good job of recognizing uh, people of color, African Americans, uh, Indian Americans, any, anybody else that, uh, Asian Americans is considered a minority, but that's a problem in our community when we we don't have uh, when our political leadership is uh, predominantly African American, and but in our business community it hasn't developed. Something's not working right. I don't have the solution to it, and uh, and I know that's not why I was up here to talk. But uh, it, it always dawns on me that uh, there's no capital base in the uh, black community, and and you can see it here when we got a group of of entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs and we all kind of look the same, not quite, but we kind of all look the same. So I, I just wanted to say that, but I went to school uh, at the University of Texas in Austin, and uh, it wasn't for any reason, I didn't have any identification with Texas, my sister went there, I went to there, I was gonna go to Tulane, I was gonna go to Texas, I had a better party at Texas, I went to Texas. <laughs> so it was, uh, and, and those were the two schools I applied to. But I, I was always interested in real estate, I was kind of a rubbernecker, I would always come around, look, look at stuff, so I was in college, I got my real estate license and I worked at uh, two real estate companies. And, uh, and, I, and I thought that's what I wanted to do, I wanted to have a career in real estate. So uh, when I got, a, I got a real estate finance degree at the University of Texas, I got my license in Tennessee, I got my license in Texas, I was gonna stay in Austin, it's a pretty good town. And in intervening years, my mother passed away, who'd worked for my dad, as I talked about. And my father was, not that much interested in his business anymore, wasn't interested in the business side of it, and really didn't have that much enthusiasm for, for doing it. So one of the summers I decided I'd come home and I'd, I worked uh, over in the business and he had a little small business that, wasn't, that he didn't pay much attention to but that put in like car stereos, car alarms, cell phones, believe it or not, hadn't even come out yet, uh, and some two-way radios, which like if uh, plumbers used them, walkie-talkies or uh, they used them at the Grizzly game to sit there and talk around, but Motorola radios, those kind of things. 
So I spent the summer and I was selling. And I said, yeah, it's kind of fun. I really enjoy this. And I was over in an office by myself. I had some employees over there. I just kind of did my own thing. And uh, my dad was over at his manufacturing plant. He didn't pay much attention to it. So I said, this is kind of good. So he says to me, you move back here, you can run that business. Well, it was doing about $200,000 a year. So it wasn't doing very much. And uh, so I, I, I got done with school and I tried to get jobs with everybody. I hope nobody in the room I tried to get a job with, but uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I like Popeye's fried chicken. I called the real estate department and sent them a resume. I said, hey, I'd like to come do your site. I have my license. Nah, we're not hiring. Uh, I called everybody, uh, Bells, uh, Weston, whoever was here and I interviewed Trammell Crow, interviewed with all of them, nothing. So I'm, I'm, I go over working at my dad's place and I said, God, I kind of like this, but I didn't like the dealing with a customer, a consumer, like selling something and anybody in the room that deals with consumers might not like dealing with consumers. And so I didn't want someone like a cordless telephone saying, you know, when I go in the closet, it cuts off. Hey, can you fix it? So all that stuff I quit doing. I said, I'm going to sell radios, like to plumbers. So the, I didn't have much business, but I had some licenses that were on towers, and this kind of segues into what I do, and I had some licenses. So there were shared things, and it was like uh, in Green Acres, I think. Didn't they used to climb up on the pole and talk on the, <laughs> so, except we had a way to not climb up on the pole. So, uh, I, a radio, so you key your radio, it goes to a transmitter that has an antenna, sh shoots back down, everybody talks. And uh, it was kind of a party line. So you'd have to kind of listen to see if anybody was on there. So I said, well, that's, that's the business that uh, I want to be in. The only probably didn't have many customers, and cell phones were actually coming out right around the time. So my customers were a few existings I had. Uh, there was a uh, guy that owned a bunch of uh, entertainment clubs that had a bunch of cab companies. He was a big customer. And, um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then there's a, um, there's a community of um, travelers that live over near the airport on Shelby Drive, and, uh, and they go and do paving jobs, and so they have radios. So they were my customer, and then the cell phones came out. Does anybody know the first people that had cell phones? People that sell pharmaceuticals. Uh, but <laughs> So I was real busy on Thursday and Friday putting in car phones into like Corvettes. And uh, so, so that's, those are my customers. I mean, the, uh, I didn't hang with them, I was just my customers. So, they, um, so as, as, as time went on, I, I went to a trade show and, and business got good. I mean, we grew it, got to a million bucks a year in a year or so. I mean, and, and the business, and anybody knows this, the business is residual income for me. That was always, it, and that's a real estate business is I get monthly recurring revenue from people for using my transmitters. And it was, I was charging per radio to do that. And then I had a paging, I built a paging system. I don't think anybody has a beeper anymore, but I, we had a beeper company, and if that's what they were called. And we, we started doing that. But I went to a trade show, and uh, I, I was looking around, and I saw this guy that was my competitor here, who's no longer in business, and he was over there talking to Motorola. Well, I wanted to sell Motorola, but they didn't want to, you know, they, they kind of kept to themselves. I saw him talking to him, so I, I went over when he left. And I said, well, I'd like to sell Motorola. And he said, really, where are you, Memphis? Oh, yeah, we know. Right. So I started, I, I was able to get on to sell Motorola equipment. Well, that, this was in the late 80s. Just the best product helps your business. I started selling the Motorola. And at the same time, the government was giving out licenses. I don't think they do this anymore. Uh, but they were given out a license to offer dispatch service, but it was private. It was a shared line, but it was uh, in Nextel. Has anybody ever used Nextel? Nextel, which is going to be shut down in about three or four years, has a push-to-talk deal, but it's private. You, don't, you, you can operate and say things and not have everybody else hear it. And uh, I was buying these licenses, and I was putting customers on them, and I needed tower space to do it. So I started building a few towers. And I had these systems, and it was all about residual income. And uh, in the mid, early 90s, some guy calls me out of D.C. and says, hey, this is, I think his name was Lee Dixon. He says, I, can I come down to Memphis and meet you? I want to buy your licenses. And I said, all right. So he came. We met over at the airport or something. 
And he says, I want to buy all your systems. And we, we probably, we'd grown the business to about five million bucks. And I was, I swear my office was about the size of this room. And I mean, our whole place, we had a little bay outside where the wine room is. And he said, uh, I want to buy them. I said, we can get them for 35 bucks. And you just have to prove you can use them. And he said, really? And he said, no, I don't think so. And I said, I said, yeah, I mean, he was talking about some pretty good money. And I'm like, well, give him 35 bucks. I said, so I go back to my office and we didn't have computers. You know, he didn't have the internet. So I, I called the FCC. I said, hey, I need to get some more, you know, I waited on hold too, by the way, it's the government, so I waited on hold. So I said, if you want to get some more licenses, what, what do you, what, what do I need to do? They said, well, you got to prove the need for them. I said, well, I can do that because I've got a lot of customers. I need some more because they expanded it. And they said, but, oh, you're Memphis? We're running out. And I said, no kidding. <laughs> and so immediately, I mean, and this is kind of the light bulb goes off. That, and I, I call, I, I start looking to see who's got them. And so we started collecting as many more as we could because we were a user and the government was encouraging people to use them and to put customers on them, not just speculate. And there were speculators that had to have them built. So we spent the next three years accumulating in our market. And then someone that was similar to Nextel uh, came along and they were, next, what happened was there were two cellular companies and this kind of get into where I'm going. You had, basically you had at and Verizon. That's really not the way it happened. But I'll tell you a great giveaway, I missed out on it. When Sailor came out in the early 80s, Sailor phones, the government gave away two licenses. Well, they had a B license, which anybody that was uh, the incumbent phone company, Millington Telephone, Bell South, whoever in this market, so Hatch, uh, Millington, Bell South, that was your two choices. They picked one of them got it, one of them got the license, one of them didn't. No one thought it was valuable. Hmm. And the, uh, so they settled, you know, they became partners. Well, the A license was anybody in this room. So people threw their name in the hat. There could be 700 people with their name in the hat, and then someone mixes it around and, you know, pulls out A5 or whatever. And they got the license for New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Memphis. That's the way it happened. And Bill Clinton was actually pretty smart. He decided they'd, or he had good people around him, but he was smart too. <laughs> and they decided they were going to auction all that stuff off. And I, I'll get to that. So th this stuff is going crazy. Well, Nextel, gets formed and they start looking at people like me that have these licenses that are contiguous, they're next to the, the channels where the A and B sailor guys were. So they said, we, we're going to get a third system. So they, somebody called Memphis Third Mobile bought me out, later sold it to Nextel, which was fine with me. And uh, they, uh, they uh, took it, became Nextel, and made, made a third sailor network out of the deal which was great because it, it was proliferating. Everybody wanted their cellular phone. Well, I, I sold the business and I worked for them for about six months. And I realized and this is the, I guess, and I gotta tell you, I'm a good speller. I mean, you can hand me a sheet of paper and I could look down and say, you misspelled that. Entrepreneur, <clears throat> <laughs> that was a tough one. And uh, so I couldn't even spell it, but that's, that was the, what came to me, I said, I can't work for somebody. I never worked for anybody else. I couldn't even work for my dad. I mean, he was a mile away. And, but I, I had to kind of do my own thing. And, I, and that's not everybody. Some people are comfortable in that environment. But, so I worked for these guys for about six months and they're asking me to do reports. They're asking me to, uh, that one know about this. What are your projections? And I'm like, <laughs> I was getting paid anyway. So I said, I'm gone. And I went over to my dad's office. I cleaned out a desk that had magazines from 1970 because he hadn't used that office in a while. And I had four towers. And I started calling people on the phone. We didn't have computers really then. You still didn't have internet. And I'm calling people on the phone. It's 1995. And I'm, I, I start finding people who want to get on my tower space. And 90, I, I was pretty successful. Got a few towers built. 96, 97, 98 come along. The federal government decides they're going to auction off licenses. I didn't get in the, I should have done that. But I didn't get in the, the auctions, but what happened was you had six new cell phone companies in every market. So what happened then, and, and you have it here now, you've got AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, Nextel is owned by Sprint, uh, Sailor South, Cricket, uh, and Clearwire is another new one that's going to do an uh, internet service. So all those guys needed tower space. The, and th this is uh, something that happens in business that, that, always, that, that, that always kills me is uh, people, and I read about the other day, I think the guy, the commissioner of the NFL, I was reading Sports Illustrated, and he said, uh, he says to the NFL owners when he was interviewing for the job, he says, you, you have to change before you're being forced to change. 
So I, I thought about that. I said, you know, that's pretty good. Don't go, to me it said, don't go down the tube with some business or idea that is going to go away. You gotta be flexible to change. I mean, you do internet stuff. If you resisted, if you resisted the internet, uh, uh, Borders this morning, they went bankrupt, right? Borders, I read in the paper, uh, they decided the e-strategy was bad and they let Amazon have it, basically. They, they gave it to Amazon 10 years ago, so Amazon sells more books than anybody else in the country and Borders is going bankrupt and, uh, and reorganizing. So I, I remember that, I, what Roger Goodell said, I said, that makes sense. I mean, you have to change, you gotta be flexible, and, and I do that, and, you, and I think you have to be uh, persistent. I'm, I'm not, I, I probably don't work as long hours as some people, but I don't, I don't get bogged down in, uh, in details I, I look at, but I don't get bogged down. Uh, th this week, I hate to say this, I got two of my bankers in the room, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if they came to check on me, but th th this, this week, we, we deal on leases, and I'll get into my tower business, and I won't, I won't ask some questions. So uh, this week, uh, Clearwire, which is owned by Sprint, they're putting up this uh, wireless internet service called WiMAX. So they canceled some leases on us, which in my business, if you think about 24% of the people don't even have a home phone anymore. If you're probably under the age of 30, chances are probably 40% you don't have a home phone. My son lives in a dorm at the University of Texas at Austin. There's 600 kids. I said, hey, Benjamin, how many, how many people have uh, home, or phones, you know, you go in and out of the rooms all the time. He said, nobody. He said, everybody uses, you know, their cell phone. And um, the, uh, uh, but I, I usually don't lose customers because we're in a growing business. But so Clearwire sends us some cancellation notices on some stuff. They said they're not going to build the system. So I thought about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. God, it's terrible. Yeah, it's revenue, multiples. So I go, we talk about it a few minutes. I was done. I mean, I hadn't, I didn't, I didn't like stay up all night, wake up in the middle of the night and watch TV because I was worried about it. I cared, but I move on. And that, that really helps me. Maybe I'm shallow, but I just, <laughs> I just think if you, if you, uh, if you'd let, the, if you hang on to stuff, at least for me in business and, and you're sitting there talking about it, I, I, I run a lot. I used to uh, run with a guy. And so we, we ran a couple marathons together. And so he, he's running and. I'd get about running 10 or 12 miles. He'd say, I'm tired. I mean, I'm really tired. And I'm running out of stuff to talk about. And he was, the family was in a business. And uh, he would, uh, he, he hates his family. And they're like, uh, all the cousins, none of them talk. And he doesn't like them. So we, and I, I can't tell you who it was. <laughs> but William knows him. But, uh, but so we get, you know, I had about four or five miles to go. And I, I was just spent. And I'd say, hey, uh, I'll say his name. I said, how's your uncle doing? And so for the next four miles, he's a no good son. And, and I would, that, I was home stretch. I mean, I, I would do that. You know, or her sister got divorced. What, how's her husband? Oh, God, you know, I mean, he is bad. And I, and I mean, I don't, I don't have that kind of anger. I forget about it. The, uh, I, just, I just move on. And I tell you, that, that, uh, that really serves me well. And, and another thing, and I'll tell you what I'm doing currently, uh, but I, I remember this. The bathroom at my office had a, a thing that someone cut out of the paper and they framed it. And it said, uh, uh, what's it, say? it said a diamond is a piece of coal that's stuck to the job. Now, it was in the bathroom, so I used to see it a little bit. And, but I thought that was a great saying. I, I remember that, I mean, it was, it was probably in there for 30 years and we redid the bathrooms. I, I don't know where it went. But uh, I, I just, the, the saying always stayed with me. And I mean, I can't get up here and quote scripture or anything or poetry, but I remember that little saying that said, a diamond is a piece of coal that stuck to the job. And I kind of followed that. And so, it, it, but just kind of wrap up, over the years, uh, we've gotten deeper into the tower business. And our strategy's been, and this is about capitalization, because I know, Tammy, we're talking about uh, how to grow your business. Uh, on our personal balance sheet, my bankers know that. And we would borrow, build, build some towers, and we'd sell them. There's a public market. There's three publicly traded tower companies, Crown Castle, SBA, and American Tower. They own 23,000. Get this, this is kind of interesting. They own 23, 24,000. We own about 700 towers. I'm like number seven in the country. So it is a, it's a uh, very close-knit and concentrated business uh, 
in, in a small area, but we have a ready market to sell towers. So over the years, we built tranches of towers, sold, started out selling seven, sold 11, 15, 40, 100, then 150. So we've, we've built it bigger, we've scaled it up. And, uh, but I it, don't stick, I don't, I don't rely on the business uh, and doing it the same way. Three years ago, we, uh, we started buying distressed assets. And, and not because of the mortgage meltdown or anything like that. It had nothing to do with the market, because our market has actually outperformed other real estate. Uh, it's stayed the same because it's infrastructure and uh, it's kind of vertical real estate is what we like to call it, the cell towers. And uh, the big guys were merging. They had excess assets, didn't know what to do with them, so we bought them. They, they got off of them, we rehabbed them, and we're putting new customers on them. So that, that's been our strategy. And that kind of started growing. We did a, we, we've done four or five transactions. So now, um, in the middle of all that, a friend of mine I play golf with, uh, Jeff Meskin, who's a partner at Brown Brothers Harriman Investment Bank in New York. Uh, he lives in Memphis, works in New York, and play golf, and he, he liked our business. And we'd never had investors. I mean, I got people all the time, maybe some in the room, I can't look to see, that said, hey, can I put some money in your business? I'm like, no. And, uh, <laughs> but if you want to work, you can, you know, I mean, I've had partners over the years, and it's always been good for me. I mean, the partners are great. But uh, we'd never had an investment partner, but I think to grow to the next level where we are, we needed that. And they've been, they, they bought a you know, 25, 30% share of our business at a tough time in 2008 when the world was melting down. And, uh, but it's allowed us to grow and take advantage of opportunities. And uh, that's pretty much where we kind of are standing today. We're, we're out there building towers. Uh, to my bankers in the room, we're doing great. Business is good. <laughs> Our growth is uh, phenomenal and uh, keep lending. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, and, and I will tell you one last thing, we ask questions if that's what you want. You gotta stick with what you, what you know. And, and, I, and I, I'm a good example of that. Uh, I own some restaurants. Um, I, I've, uh, anytime I put money in a private placement of somebody else, and my wife tells me this, my wife Robin tells me this all the time. She says, if you're not involved in it, you don't need to do it. Now, I'm not talking about Kerr and Chad who do a good job managing money. Y'all do a very good job. But, uh, but that's different, because that's especially. But if someone comes in front of me and hands me a private placement, um, and, and this, I know you're talking about you don't want advertisements, so this is an anti-advertisement. I can tell you I'm not going to do it. And I'm sure everybody's got great ideas, but I've got to rely on myself. And uh, if, if someone tells me they can make a 27% return, well, I, I can make a 27% return, and, and I'm the one getting up every morning and paying the bills and doing whatever else. And, and in the end, I'm not going to throw up my hand and say, ah, I'm sorry. And, uh, and it, it just didn't work out. So. Uh, I'm kind of done with, with that kind of stuff, and, and I've lost money on it too. I mean, you work hard doing one thing, you go throw it away over here. And uh, so, and we've all done that. I mean, uh, show of hands, no. And so, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, the closing, uh, any questions we'll answer, but this is a great city. Uh, you've got wonderful people like everybody in the room, but Scott back there who, who takes care of people that are underserved in our community and uh, other people that do great things in the city got a great history of entrepreneurs here and uh, I've learned how to spell it and uh, that's very appreciate y'all listening I appreciate the free lunch and uh, if there are any questions uh